Good afternoon. At ease, people. Good afternoon, everybody. If I could have you take a seat, please. Thank you, and uh, welcome uh, to today's telehealth program. Uh, my name is Frank Chalet, and I'm the uh, president of the Parkinson's Resource Center here in Spokane. And I'd like to welcome everybody here in our rural sites, our remote sites, and uh, all of you here in Spokane for being here today. Uh, first of all, a few thank yous. So I'd like to uh, thank all the uh, remote sites for their contributions and support of telehealth over time. Uh, without you, our program uh, wouldn't be nearly as robust, and so thank you for being part of this each and every time. I'd also like to thank our sponsors that make telehealth happen, uh, Northwest Parkinson's team over in Seattle, uh, Albertsons, and uh, also I'd like to uh, thank uh, St. Luke's, our host here, and uh, Parkinson's Resource Center, and I'd also like to uh, extend a thank you to the Northwest Telehealth staff who are here and work with us every time. I think they do a terrific job of bringing this program uh, to us each and every time. And lastly, for uh, supporting our speaker today, I'd like to also um, thank uh, Teva Neuroscience very much for their support for making uh, today's program happen. Uh, one other thing, some of you may have been expecting uh, a talk today um, on caregiving, uh, Daryl Kane uh, has been uh, gracious in allowing us to do a little flip-flop today and bringing in our featured speaker. And so we also want to extend a, a warm thank you to Daryl Kane for being flexible. And there will be uh, further caregiving uh, topics uh, in the future, okay? As is customary to the program, uh, I would ask uh, that both the remote sites as well as the folks here in Spokane, if you'd uh, please hold your questions till the end of the presentation. And then, uh, as is customary, um, I will come back and we will go to each site and ask you to uh, bring forward any questions that you might have for our featured speaker. And lastly, before I introduce our speaker, I would ask the remote sites at this time if you would please mute uh, your microphones. Uh, so that way we minimize uh, any disruption, including uh, how it may affect the slides as we continue to go forward. So thank you in advance for doing that. So without further ado, uh, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our featured speaker. Some of you know him, some of you may not, but you're in for a treat today. Uh, Dr. Anthony Santiago, he's a uh, well-practiced, uh, very popular uh, and wonderful neurologist and movement disorder specialist that is with us today. Uh, he works at the Muhammad Ali Parkinson Center in Phoenix, Arizona, and the Barrow Neurological Institute. Today's topic that Dr. Santiago is going to bring to us is Parkinson's disease, care and cure, two sides of the same coin. So without any further delay, I bring you Dr. Anthony Santiago. Thank you. Good afternoon, and I want to uh, thank the same people that Frank did. I want to thank Teva Neuroscience, of course, uh, the PRC, the Northwest Parkinson's Foundation, uh, St. Luke's. To the conferencing uh, system. Please enter the conference code now. Okay. Uh, and I also have a couple personal thank yous. Uh, I would like to thank Daryl Kane personally and uh, thank him graciously for allowing me uh, the privilege of presenting today. Um, and in addition, I, I would like to uh, ask us all to uh, remember uh, some of the people in our family who have uh, left us since I last had the privilege of being here uh, in November 2008, and a speedy recovery to Ed Ewell, who uh, I understand I'll be uh, seeing shortly after this uh, presentation. And anybody who's been a part of telehealth or the PRC in Spokane, certainly Ed needs no introduction. Um, my topic today is really a continuation of a dialogue we've been having for about six years. And that is uh, that no significant advance occurs in any disease, especially 
something like Parkinson's disease, without having a caring attitude. In fact, I'd make the argument that every major advance in the disease that's happened at the bench, in the lab, is because somebody had a caring intention to listen to a patient. And so we're going to go through some of that historically today and then look at how that's progressing forward uh, and along the way maybe fill in some gaps in all of our knowledge. Okay. Francis Peabody uh, made this comment in the early 1900s. And I think that it can't be overstated that in a career like medicine, if someone doesn't recognize the intimacy of that patient-doctor relationship, then nothing else can develop. There won't be a caring model. There won't be an exchange of ideas. There won't be a dialogue. And that won't lead us down paths of discovery. But it doesn't really begin in 20th century medicine, obviously. And for some of you that have heard me speak before, this may be a slide that you may recall. Or if you've ever been in an exam room with me, you'd know that this is a quote that is uh, right next to my uh, chair where I sit and speak with my patients. It points to the idea that first and foremost is the intention to relieve the suffering of others. And without that as a wholehearted, deep intention, one then won't be patient with themselves and with their patients themselves to gather the information that leads us down a caring and a curing type pathway. The fact is, is that taking care of anyone with Parkinson's disease is a matter of teamwork. First and foremost, of course, the patient themselves has a team. They have a support team. They have their family. They have their caregivers. They have their friends. And they also have the relationship to themselves. And that has to be partnered with a physician who then has to partner with others. The fact is, is that Parkinson's disease overwhelmingly requires so many other colleagues. Certainly anybody who's been under my care, under the care of other movement disorder neurologists knows that we rely on physical therapy overwhelmingly rely on physical therapy. Speech therapy, occupational therapy, neuropsychologist, clinical psychologist, nutritionist, neuroradiologist, neurosurgeons. And if one isn't adapting throughout the course and bringing in other allied professionals, then that dialogue starts to stifle and the level of care starts to stifle. And so again, this entire talk, almost every slide, we're going to talk about a dialogue, a conversation, a sense of teamwork. No conversation about Parkinson's disease uh, uh, would lack some sort of comment about James Parkinson himself. And a few things I think that are important, although our conversation here in the West begins with him, uh, the fact is, is that in antiquity we see a number of other presentations of what we call Parkinson's disease. Uh, more than 2,500 years ago in ancient Sanskrit was a disease called Kampavada, shaking weakness. They actually had a treatment, a bean paste. That bean paste actually had dopamine-like properties and it was actually helpful for some of the symptoms. We can go back to Greco-Roman times and look at artwork that obviously shows some of the postures associated with Parkinson's disease and even to the Inca civilizations and look at artwork that shows patients with dystonia. But our conversation typically begins with James Parkinson and I think it's a good place to start because what he essentially did at the age of 62 was to take a great personal interest in a number of individuals that simply walked by his window of his exam room. That's how this book was written. In fact, in Victorian times, there wasn't very much of a physical exam. He watched these individuals, and he would watch them over time, their posture change, their walking change, and he took such a great interest in their suffering that he invited them in. And he interviewed them over and over and developed an outstanding small treatise, an essay on the shaking palsy, that actually is still highly accurate in a number of its observations about the human condition. The science has changed. Our understanding of the whys have changed. 
But what he observed was because he took a caring interest in those people. And that ultimately led to Jean-Martin Charcot, truly the preeminent neurologist of the 19th century. And in fact, it's Dr. Charcot who named it Parkinson's disease as a tribute to James Parkinson. Charcot trained most of the significant neurologists of history, Babinski, Duchenne, Tourette's. His interest was taking a human being and going through that story, the story of their life, the story of their presentation, and systematically reviewing that with them, teaching others to do the same, and ultimately trying to find out what is happening to this person. Why is there a tremor? Why did they have a stroke? Why do they have multiple sclerosis? And in fact, it's Charcot, who in Western literature wrote about the first treatment for Parkinson's disease, hyosamine, an anticholinergic, in fact, uh, a belladonna alkaloid that's in some ways rather similar to Artane, which some of you may have been on. And that type of knowledge is outstanding because at the time, there were very few understandings of the brain pathology before him. There were no discovery of the neurotransmitters or the chemicals that make up the activities of the brain, but it was an, an enormous caring attitude to understand that human suffering that led him to these discoveries. And one of the most important discoveries is something called the Louis body. It's named for F.H. Louis. Dr. Louis in 1912 was working in Alzheimer's lab, and he was looking at the brain specimens of patients who had what appeared to be a rather challenging time with their memory. What he discovered, in fact, were these proteinaceous inclusions in areas of the brain that appeared to be prominent in patients that had Parkinson's disease. And in fact, it wasn't until 1919 that the first neurotransmitter was discovered, but it's F.H. Louis, hence the Louis body uh, named for him, that was able to take us from a caring attitude at the bedside to the first true evidence in the brain of a pathological hallmark. And in fact, we're still working on this. Just because it simply was described then doesn't mean we understood it. And in fact, some genetic forms of Parkinson's disease and even what we consider sporadic or by chance, a lot of it has to do with the protein constituency or the makeup of these bodies or why do they form? What happens once they're formed? And again, it's that interest in the human condition that drove them to the bench to understand this. If you spend any time with a person with Parkinson's disease, you'll often ask them when they were diagnosed, and they'll tell you when they first had a doctor tell them. And often the doctor will base the timing of that on when they first recognized a physical symptom, maybe a tremor. In fact, two-thirds of the time, it would be a tremor, often in the hand, often at rest or when distracted. And people will start timing their Parkinson's disease by that clinical fact. The reality is that isn't when it starts. And in fact, as this slide shows, if one looks way over on screen left where it says motor, specific symptoms, and one sees the red curve crossing the dark black line, that occurs when a specific area of the brain has already lost upwards of 70% of the cells that make dopamine in an area called the substantia nigra. And in fact, by the time your very first physical symptom emerges, that area has lost upwards of 70% of the cells that make dopamine. And that is termed, at this point, early disease, very early in the process. The reality is, is that if you spend enough time with people and have a caring attitude to hear their story, you start to find out that other things are happening at the same time and even other things predating it substantially. And this is really where we are now. This is where our care and our cure are, pa are crossing paths. It's the opportunity to spend legitimate time with a person in the office setting to hear their story, to get their narrative 
that is pointing us now to our understanding of truly when does Parkinson's disease begin and what are some of the first changes in the brain. Because some of these things are things such as loss of sense of smell or taste. In fact, we now know that for some individuals, that can predate the first physical symptom by as much as a decade, maybe four or five years. Anxiety or depression. Situational anxiety. A person, a man or a woman who has been able to juggle everything in their life exceptionally well all of their life. Everybody always says they're the most efficient three people that they know. <laughs> but suddenly they're stressed easily. They feel overwhelmed. They have some depression that it almost takes on a sense of both apathy and despondency. And it's short-lived, and they can work their way through it, but it's happening more often. And often that can occur three, four years prior to the first physical symptom. Fatigue. Physical and mental fatigue. Hard to stay on task. Things that have been well-learned for years, hard to concentrate. Just physical fatigue. Just running out of fuel. Bladder. Bowel dysfunction changes, constipation. In fact, for some patients, we now know that their constipation that's unexplained might be 10, 15, 20 years before their first Parkinson's symptom defined as a tremor. Sleep changes, very specific sleep changes, sometimes very fragmented, sometimes frightful dreams, sometimes very active, kicking, shouting, yelling dreams. Sensory changes, tingling, numbness, pain, stiffness, it's not uncommon for a person prior to their diagnosis of Parkinson's disease to start seeing their primary care considerably for three or four years before that diagnosis. Maybe they think they have some arthritis in their shoulder or their wrist or their knee. They're not sleeping well. They're a little depressed, a little constipated. Often these were things that we thought about after the fact, up until fairly recently. And so it's hard sometimes to go back historically to somebody who's had Parkinson's for 15 years and ask them those questions. But they are part of our inquiries now, right from day one. And they're very important measures. We often define Parkinson's disease by the presence of very specific features. And again, these come back to Dr. Parkinson and Dr. Charcot defining this. A tremor, a stiffness, or rigidity akinesia, slowness, or absence of movement, or balance problems. But if you're sitting in an office and you say to somebody, so have you got postural instability, you're going to get the kind of look that you're all looking at me now. But you would understand, how's your handwriting? How is it to take your wallet out of your pocket or quickly have to write that check or use one of those slide-through ATMs at the supermarket? Have people been asking you if you're okay lately? Do they think you're upset more often? That you don't seem as expressive or smile as much? Do they think that they have to wait for you to catch up when they're walking with you? Do you feel like everyone's always telling you to sit up straight? Those types of physical changes are occurring, but they're not occurring early. We used to think of those as more early-like features, maybe within that first year or two when people notice it, but we now know based on listening to people's stories, that that happens later in the brain than we used to originally think. In fact, it's the understanding of people's stories that lead us to now look at people's brains as they evolve. And one of the very first things that happens in a Parkinson-like brain years before there's a tremor or another physical symptom are actual legitimate changes in the brain that do things like bladder, bowel, and sense of smell. And then it progresses to things like fatigue and wakefulness and sleep cycles and speed of processing and reflexes and visual processing when driving. That sense that you're able to balance all of that information quickly and put it together. And in fact, it isn't until something later on that we even begin to see any changes in the movement control parts of the brain. Years into the process, and as the disease progresses, we see that it does affect other areas outside the movement, areas where we put higher order things together, things where we are coordinating driving, working on a ladder, 
uh, working on the computer and being interrupted and going back to what you were doing, or if you're a woman who does a lot of complicated stitching or knitting, and if somebody distracts you, something that you've done easily for years suddenly becomes a challenge to do again from a concentration standpoint, kind of keeping everything juggling well and keeping all the balls in the air. So if you listen to the first few minutes of this, this is a pretty depressing conversation. But the reality is we have to know that. We have to hear that story. We have to take an interest in each person's individual story because it's a collection of those individual stories that's beginning to lead us to understanding that this is happening much earlier than perhaps we thought a decade ago or even 20 years ago. And although in an individual life, 10 or 20 years may seem like a long time, in science, that's a very short amount of time, and a lot of strides have been made. This is a very challenging slide, so I'm not going to ask you to, to read it and understand it, but I want to point out a few features. The first one is, is that it says genetic factors. 15, 20 years ago, if I had walked into a meeting and talked about the genetics of Parkinson's disease, I'd have been ridiculed. It was always thought to be purely by chance a sporadic disease. In fact, it was very rarely thought of as a genetic component. We now know of 16 identifiable forms. Some of those occur more often than we thought. In fact, one of the more common ones, um, LERC2 or PARC8, probably roughly 2% of patients in North America carry that mutation. But uniquely, even carrying that mutation, there's only roughly 20 to 30% chance that you'd actually develop Parkinson's. So in and of itself, it's not sufficient. There are other forms that are very rare. Yet, if you carry that gene, it's more likely you will present that in life. And so there's a real variability, meaning that it has to be a number of factors, including environmental factors. And we can go back to the industrial times and look at certain toxic heavy metals, mercury and others that we know affect the nervous system. Carbon monoxide affects the nervous system. But we now understand things like pesticides and herbicides. In fact, one of the more commonly well-known ones, rotenone, actually is well-known to cause an animal model of Parkinson's in a very specific way. It does one thing. It depletes certain energy areas of the cell of coenzyme Q10. That's all it does. But it's additive and cumulative over years. And in a monkey model, non-human primate model, it develops a form of Parkinson's just by exposure to that toxin. Of course, we wouldn't know to study herbicides, I guess, if we didn't take the life story of farmers or people that grew up there or had well water. So again, at some point, somebody had to take enough interest in a person's story years ago before we even understood that these things were possible to ultimately lead us down these paths. For us today, this slide reveals a few important facts. The biggest one is that there are times when people are exposed to a particular chemical or have a certain genetic mutation, and we understand the science of that. And the question is, can we build off of that to other forms of Parkinson's or to most patients who have Parkinson's? This is an unfortunate picture. This is a group of heroin addicts who, in the late 1970s, did a street drug called China White. And it was actually a synthetic form of Demerol. And within days, they developed a syndrome of advanced Parkinson's disease. In fact, what takes years and maybe decades to occur naturally happened over days. And it was that chemical that we suddenly realized may create selective vulnerability. Maybe there are toxins we're exposed to or genes we carry that can selectively destroy certain areas of the brain in such a rapid fashion. Now, this is an extremely unfortunate picture, but I have to be honest, extremely fortunate for the field because it really created the first thought that maybe we understand why Parkinson's occurs in the brain, what the chemical changes are, and is it possible to slow it down or potentially cure it? In fact, 
those particular individuals took a drug that by itself wasn't toxic. It had to be converted in the brain by a very specific chemical called monoamine oxidase B. And what it did was it took that parent compound, it was converted, and that converted compound was extremely toxic to the brain cells that make dopamine. So the first thought was, well, how does this react to normal? Every day, run-of-the-mill Parkinson's disease in the late 70s, early 80s, as they were trying to understand this, and they knew a couple things. One is that that chemical apparently starts to increase in activity as we naturally age, and our dopamine levels go down. So the thought was, well, Maybe this has some implication. Maybe if over many years this is happening naturally in the brain, maybe we should try to slow down this particular chemical. And that's what we've been doing. In fact, this drug class has been around for many years, and in the 1960s it was used as something called a psychic stimulator. It was used to treat depression and apathy, this drug class. But around this time they developed the drug selegiline. And the thought was, well, this will block this enzyme. That'll treat the Parkinson's symptoms because people will have more available dopamine, but maybe it also protects the brain. And they put together a number of elaborate trials to try to discover this, and ultimately it was found that it didn't slow the progression of Parkinson's. It did treat the symptoms, but it didn't slow the progression. The thought was is that somehow it had to be this monoamine oxidase B activity it had to be lessened because what happens is when it's very active, it creates a lot of oxidative stress, free radicals, uh, hydrogen peroxide, and that causes cells to accelerate and die faster. So it really left people in a quandary. They thought, well, geez, this makes so much sense. Fact is, is that this is one of about 30 proteins that are on your cell lining. It's involved in trafficking of things in and out of a certain area of the cell that makes energy. In fact, that same area of the cell where coenzyme Q10 is important, this particular area is important. You have organs in your body, hearts, lungs, livers, and every cell has organelles, a brain called a nucleus, and it has a liver essentially called the mitochondria. It's where you do all your energy requiring reactions in the cell, and that is an area that gets highly dysfunctional in various forms of Parkinson's so that a person doesn't make enough energy or doesn't traffic proteins properly. And so it's an area of research. And again, we have a couple different forms of it. They actually aren't the same drugs. And anybody who knows me and has worked with me knows that I'm not a salesman, not here to sell a drug. The fact is, is that Teva, which is sponsoring this, does make the drug Azelect or Versagiline. And selegiline is a generic competitor. But that's not why I'm talking about resagiline today. It's because it is different in some ways. Some of the research has shown that some of our early thoughts that maybe blocking this enzyme could be helpful and neuroprotective, we've come to find out that it's not really about the action of the drug, but a particular part of the molecule. So... This is a quick primer on the various medications you take, and then we'll talk a little bit more about Azelect or Versagiline. So many people in here are on Levodopa, a precursor form of dopamine. Basically, that means it has to eventually be converted to dopamine in the brain. You can't just take plain dopamine. Too large a molecule, doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, makes you extremely sick. In fact, if you took just dopamine, it's very similar to the very early studies in the 50s and 60s, hoping that maybe that would help treat the Parkinson's symptoms. It's when your levodopa is converted too early to dopamine in your stomach and in your bloodstream that you get all the symptoms, like profound nausea and lightheadedness and all of that. And so we have other things like carbidopa and these COMT inhibitors, if anyone here is on COMTAN or TASMAR. All those drugs do is prevent the levodopa from being converted to dopamine in your gut so that it can actually get into the brain, where ultimately it's converted to dopamine. 
it's released, and it acts where it's supposed to. That's all it does. Just like you make your own natural dopamine, we give you an artificial form, levodopa. Sometimes you'll get uh, something that's dopamine-like. Some of you may be on Ropinarol or Requip or Premapexol or Mirapex, or perhaps you were on the new Pro patch. And these are dopamine-like drugs. They don't work in the gut. They don't have any need to be converted or dietary restrictions, but they go straight to the area of the brain and stimulate the similar receptors. They also have their own challenges. They're well known for things like obsessive compulsive and gambling and nightmares and lightheadedness and feigning and wild dreams and hallucinations and uh, not that all Parkinson's medications can't do that to a small degree but these drugs are particularly prone to that and then in the brain once you have that dopamine ultimately it is broken down because that's what happens in the brain it makes a chemical, it uses it, it breaks it down, it recycles the pieces and remakes the chemical. But sometimes we can take advantage of that, and over on the one corner of the slide there you see MAOB inhibitors. And that's where selegiline or resagiline work. They prevent the dopamine that's in your brain from breaking down too early, so that your levodopa will last longer, or the natural dopamine you make will last longer, so you don't have as much wearing off of your medication, and it lasts longer. That's kind of how the drugs are working and why they're designed the way they are, purely from a treatment standpoint. But our interest in this drug isn't only because it treats symptoms by making more dopamine available, which is one of the problems in Parkinson's disease, but it's the propargyl side ring a little bit of chemistry, and I thought, you know, a little bit of tough stuff here on, on a Monday afternoon. You know, there's something really unique about this drug, and there's a reason why we've been thinking about it as maybe disease modifying or slowing down the progression of Parkinson's. It has nothing to do with what it actually does for your symptoms, meaning make your dopamine last longer. But it's this actual side molecule which has some very important benefits. And these are not slides, these next two, that I want you to memorize, but what I want to do is give you kind of a gestalt. In the brain, when a cell is dying, there are a number of pathways that can occur. It has a language. And a series of chemical changes occur to cause a cell to die. It's a programmed cell death. In fact, it's one of our most natural defenses against cancer. When you have a cancer-like cell and the body recognizes it as abnormal, there's actually a host of situations where it tries to kill off that cell so that cancer doesn't develop. We have these self-protective things in our body. And they also happen with just normal cells that are aging. We need to get rid of them. But these particular things on the bottom of the slide, mitochondrial permeabilization and all of these other issues, these are the pathways that cause your cells to die more quickly. And things like certain environmental toxins like pesticides or certain genetic forms of Parkinson's cause these things to happen rapidly. Any molecule that has this propergel ring appears to slow down these deleterious things, very separate from the activity of the drug. And in fact, they promote a number of self-protective systems in the brain. So what they're doing really is helping prevent cell death and increase cell energy. At least that's what it says in the test tube. That's what it says in mice. That's what it says in rats. It says in some monkey models. The question is, how well does that happen in humans? Well, we don't usually go and look at the individual cells in your brain and go take a few to look at this. So we have to come up with a clinical trial. What can we do at the bedside by either giving you a drug or you're not taking that drug and say, what's happening to you personally? And that's what this study was. And some of you may have been in uh, at various sites. I know there's people from all over the Northwest. Essentially what they did was they took very young patients with Parkinson's, even though the age appeared to be a very large range when you really look at the data, somewhat younger patients, 
and the majority were within four months of their diagnosis. That's pretty early, at least traditionally what's early, right? We all know now that maybe by the time you get there with your tremor, you're a little bit further into the game than traditionally thought, but within about four months of diagnosis, not on any other medications, nothing. And so the whole idea was if something is going to protect the brain, we should be able to see a difference between people who perhaps for a period of time are on a placebo or sugar pill and people given the drug. Watch them over a period of time and then in the second half, both groups get the drug and then look at them and say, did the group that was on the drug longer, did their Parkinson's progress more slowly? And how do we do that? Well, we do the bedside exam. And for anybody here who's been one of my patients, you know the monotony of all the finger taps and the hand openings and closings and checking for stiffness and all the walking up and down the hallway. That's literally what we measure. We measured it for a period of time, and the evidence was mixed. At one dose of the drug, it absolutely showed that it seemed to be slowing the progression of Parkinson's, and at another dose, it didn't. And uniquely, the higher dose didn't. So, it led to what happens when all doctors get together. An argument. A debate. Supposedly professional, but almost always personal. All politics are local. Um, the debate going on in our field is not about whether the drug protects cells. I think that actually is fairly well established, and I'm saying that as it's being recorded and going out to my colleagues. I stand and put my quarter on the table. The question for us is whether or not we've studied it adequately. The problem with that study was that these patients were very early. They had very small number of physical features, and the dose was rather potent. And so it's possible that it caused something called a floor effect, meaning that it relieved the symptoms to the point where you couldn't capture progression, meaning that it had a symptom effect. And when we looked at the statistics, and you see the two sides here arguing, my colleague Eric Oshkog at Mayo and Warren Alano, who's in New York, basically they're arguing over, is this drug protecting cells and is it helping people? They're not really arguing about the drug, and this was the points taken from a major journal just about a month ago. They have been fighting publicly on this, writing articles one way or the other. When you really tease through it, they're fighting about the trial design because it's very hard with people to create a study that really shows disease protection, and here's why. I'd have to take a group of you, and I'd have to ask you not to be on anything for a long time, and then another group gets something for a long time, maybe five, seven, ten years, and I'd need a lot of people willing to do that, which of course is unethical, because in order to really show the difference between a particular drug and no treatment at all would ask of people something very inhuman. So we do these short studies, because we can only ask people for about nine months or so, maybe 18 at the most to go without medication when they first are diagnosed because after a while their quality of life is really suffering and we just can't ethically ask that so we play these numbers games and we do as much as we can do and then we look at the statistics that's the truth and so sometimes when we're debating a fact we're not debating the chemical or the science we're debating the study that we can do in people in everyday life so, what are we left to do? Well, the fact is, is that on every slide that I presented today, I talked about having a caring attitude at the bedside. To recognize that some of the most significant advances of the last half a decade to a decade were because somebody took the time to hear somebody's story. It wasn't some discovery on an MRI that led us to some of these ideas. It was sitting down with another human being and listening to them. So I want to read something to you. Now, 
Not only do I need the glasses, I forgot where I put them. That's... <laughs> so, uh, William Carlos Williams. Well-known poet. Bollinger Prize in Poetry. Pulitzer Prize. National Book Award. But also a physician. And anybody here who kind of in high school had to read one or two of his poems probably is aware of you know, the red wheelbarrow and things along those lines. He really transformed poetry, but there are some other things about him that most people don't realize. Um, he grew up in a very poor family in Rutherford, New Jersey, and never left, despite all of his claim and fame. And he stayed there as a small-town doctor, delivered well over 30,000 children, and was an extremely hard-working person. And I want to read you the opening paragraph to this uh, essay, which uh, is very important to me and maybe uh, defines the theme of today's talk for you. It's the humdrum, day in, day out, everyday work that is the real satisfaction of the practice of medicine. The million and a half patients a man has seen on his daily visits over a 40-year period of weekdays and Sundays that make up his life. Million and a half patients. I mean, that's a lot of work. Um, I never had a money practice. It would have been impossible for me. But the actual calling on people at all times and under all conditions, the coming to grips with the intimate conditions of their lives, when they were born, when they were dying, watching them die, watching them get well has always absorbed me. Time after time, I've gone out into my office in the evening feeling as if I couldn't keep my eyes open a moment longer. I would start out on my morning calls after only a couple hours of sleep, sit in the hallway outside a room waiting to get the courage to walk in. But once I saw the patient, all that would disappear. In a flash, the details of the case would begin to formulate themselves into a recognizable outline. The diagnosis would unravel itself or refuse to make itself plain and the hunt was on. Along with that, the patient himself would shape up into something that called for attention, his peculiarities, reticences, or candors. And although I might be attracted or repelled, the professional attitude which every physician must call upon would steady me and dictate the terms on which I was to proceed. Fact is, is that there isn't going to really be any significant development in Parkinson's disease or any other disease for that matter, unless the intimate relationship between a doctor and a patient is maintained. And that intimacy isn't just compassion. It's time. It's taking the time to get to know another person, to hear their story. And then your work isn't done the moment the patient leaves the room. It's reflecting on it. It's documenting it. It's collating it. It's examining it. And it's paying attention. And putting that information together, because every person who comes to every support group meeting Every patient who walks in the door is a person who may unlock the key, but more importantly, they're a person who deserves the respect and dignity of somebody caring for them fully, both at the time and taking that disease serious. And so that's what today's rather brief talk is about. Now, for me, this is brief, and anybody who knows me knows that. Um, so... I was in Spokane, Washington for six years, and I am not ashamed to say they were the most fruitful and the happiest and the most productive six years of my life. Uh, I learned by the seat of my pants how to practice medicine. The reality is, is that you're never really trained when you leave a program. You learn it, and I learned from every patient in this room that I recognize and the patients that I've seen that aren't here today. You learn about yourself, and you decide what type of physician you want to be and how you want to move the information forward. So there's both an art and a science to this. The art is in the room, but the science still has to take place afterwards. And for me, for those of you that have an interest, it wasn't that the art of medicine was lacking. It was the science. There wasn't an infrastructure to take all of this information and all of the wonderful details of your lives and put it in a way that's adequately supported or funded so that it's meaningful, that your life story is meaningful, that it contributes to moving the field forward. And so 
over the last number of months as I've looked at various positions and recently chose one in May, uh, it had to do with the fact that they had to have an absolute care model. There had to be a model that is represented in places like OHSU or Booth Gardner, where I have the utmost respect for my colleagues. And it needed to be a place that had a complete care model, but also had the infrastructure to develop a cure model, that there's science, that there's enough personnel, that there's enough technology. And so for me, for anyone who has that interest to know why I'm going where I am, it's because nothing here in Spokane failed in terms of our relationship or the art of medicine or caring for the individual. It was a structural issue in the economics of medicine that allows somebody to take that experience and not let it end there. And that really is the difference between private practice and academics. It's not that better medicine occurs in the office. You get excellent care in, primary, in private medicine. It's that that information is somehow being translated into something larger. Sometimes it's very small pieces of information, so it takes an awful lot of information to make a difference. Um, and so I leave that as maybe a public explanation. Uh, my contact information, personal information, won't be available until I'm actually down there in August full time. Uh, my duties at the moment are developing curriculums, developing clinical trials, helping develop the uh, advances in the surgery program and doing a lot of community presentations in Phoenix and developing rapport with the residents and fellows and a lot of academic things behind the scenes. But uh, I come on board around mid-August uh, and I've been told that uh, while some of my insurance credentialing won't be available, uh, certainly things like anyone who has Medicare would be because you have a lengthy period of time to submit Medicare bills. Uh, and to all my colleagues listening, I'm not, uh, this isn't predatory. I'm not trying to take your patience on you. I'm simply uh, answering what were uh, questions posed to me before the presentation. Uh, so this is the actual contact information. There's a website there. There's a phone number. That phone number goes to the general receptionist. Uh, I would ask for Christina, Christina Watts. And Christina uh, coordinates all of the uh, community education components there and is also uh, collecting all of the information from anybody who's interested perhaps in uh, coming to see me or just making inquiries about the center in general. So uh, I thank each of you. I know that Frank has a way that he likes to, to do questions, so I'll allow him to do that. But I'll also be available afterwards for any personal questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santiago, uh, and very interesting and outstanding, I think, way of helping us all better understand both the history of research and medications that are available yesterday and today, and certainly the disease. Um, I would first ask that those of you in the remote sites, uh, please do uh, turn your microphones back on, and thank you for muting your mics. Uh, this went very, very well, so I thank you for that. Um, as is uh, protocol, what I will do is um, I will go through basically alphabetically to all the remote sites and we'll end up here in Spokane. So please uh, either write down your questions uh, if you can in advance. And as I call you, uh, please do um, uh, bring yourself forward. And if we miss you, we can circle back when we kind of end things to see if there's any more questions uh, that you have for Dr. Santiago. So again, thank you for your patience in advance. So let's start first uh, with the folks uh, in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, anybody in Anchorage, do you have any questions for us today? Okay, nothing at this time. All right, let's move on. And again, if we miss you, if you have something, uh, we can always circle back. Uh, Billings, Montana, uh, any questions from you folks? No questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Clarkston, uh, Tri-State Memorial Hospital. Uh, we have no questions. Okay. But, uh, we wish to thank you and all of the Clarkston and Lewiston support group members are very pleased to see you. We wish you the very best as you join the <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very, thank you. Yeah, he was saying, were they thanking me or him? I think it was him. <laughs> Even though I did feel good for a second there. <laughs> okay, uh, the folks in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, our neighbors next door, any questions? My mother, my mother raised short, ugly children, but not dumb ones, so I, I tried not to answer too quickly. You know, there are two ways to discuss that. The first one is if we were talking about just symptomatic benefit. A lot of people get a lot of benefit from selegiline, so I wouldn't ask them to stop. That said, I have a concern with it, and that is, is that it's converted to an amphetamine and risagiline is not. And that amphetamine component is taking on more importance for me personally. I think that it does contribute to things like loss of appetite and weight loss, uh, sleep disturbances at night, maybe worsening anxiety, maybe even worsening tremor slightly, even though it enhances dopamine. Uh, so from a treatment perspective, I have a challenge with it. From a neuroprotective uh, standpoint, I do believe the amphetamine component is actually blocking some of the benefit of the uh, metabolite. So uh, I, uh, in the last uh, decade, have written one selegiline prescription because the person asked me to. And I've written quite a bit of risagiline, so maybe that uh, gives you my personal uh, preference. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Also Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. Well, he had a bad fall. Yeah. Um, Ed uh, had a bad fall, so he is recovering at this time, and so we're hoping to see him back soon. Thank you for asking. We appreciate it. Any other? Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from our friends in Coeur d'Alene? Okay. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dayton. Thank you. Dayton. Dayton General Hospital. Uh, folks, any questions there? Okay, uh, moving on to uh, Grangeville. Uh, folks in Idaho, any questions from uh, you folks? I'm in Grangeville. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question about the Ritalin. Um, I have a friend who's been on That's an excellent question. No, that's an excellent question. You know, have you been placed on any other medications since then? No, I've just been taking the carbon dopamine. Okay. And when, you, and when you do, within about an hour or so afterwards, have you ever had any similar like effect? No. Okay. That's very helpful. Not that I can think of. You know, Typically, when you first uh, posed it, it made me wonder whether you were having a form of dyskinesia, that it can be dystonic. It doesn't always have to be excessive movement like chorea. Um, but the fact that you're not having it on levodopa uh, does give me pause. I have not read, nor have I had an experience where a patient on Azelect had a dystonic reaction, but it is something that I will... Uh, do some research on, uh, since it's not my own personal experience. But I thank you for the question. Thank you very much. I enjoyed your talk very much. You're welcome. Thank you for that. And again, I appreciate your patience. There's 16 sites on today, so we've got a lot of folks out there. Uh, Kennewick General Hospital in Kennewick, Washington, any questions, please? Hi, 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Kirkland, Evergreen Healthcare. Okay, thank you. Uh, Moses Lake, uh, Samaritan Healthcare. Okay, our folks uh, in Othello, Washington at the community hospital there, any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, Pullman, uh, Pullman Regional Hospital. Hi, Bonnie. You don't really know what happens in my office, do you? You see, you all, it's always the other person. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, really? Any questions, Pullman? Yeah, Bonnie, I'll have a question. So they can see her. Yeah. Okay. You know, there are um, four other attending physicians and a number of fellows that are currently seeing patients if you need to be seen uh, on a more urgent basis. Um, I actually won't be on site and seeing patients until mid to late August. Um, but if it's something that you wanted to do, that same phone number can help set that up and perhaps you could see someone else first. Uh, and then always, if you wish to see me as well, uh, I can see you once I'm on board. Oh, the phone number. <laughs> Have you got a pen ready? Okay. Okay, it's, uh, yeah, we don't have it this way. Yep, 602-406-4931. And you want to ask for Christina. Yep, and you can tell her uh, that, you, uh, that you do know me. Uh, that you do want to get in perhaps before, however, uh, I'm seeing patients. Okay, well, I can reach out. It looks you. I can wait until you get out of Oh, okay. All right. Well, I would then, I would certainly uh, Make the call sooner rather than later, he says as he looks out in the crowd. Sooner rather than later always works, just because schedules can fill up. Okay. And uh, for those of you out there that have similar type of questions as far as contact information, uh, can they still see the slide? Well, well, we'll pop it up periodically so you can see the phone number and address. And, of course, you can always contact the Parkinson's Resource Center. And uh, our phone number is 509-473-2490. And I'm going to go back to, um, which one was it? Pullman. Oh, Pullman, thank you. <laughs> Speaking of memory loss. <laughs> uh, Pullman, uh, folks, did you have any questions there? Okay, you're good? All right. Anything? Anything else, Pullman? Okay. okay. I'm going to move on to Ritzville. Our friends in Ritzville, any questions? Yes. Thank you. I can. Okay. We have a question about involuntary um, head movements. Um, are fathers on carbidopa, levodopa, one and a half, three times a day, one in the evening, and he takes Requip XL in the evening, and um, the Exelon patch, but he's not on it at this point in time. And so we're just wondering about if there's anything 
and I'm a, well, I won't say last names, but I believe I know your dad. I do. Last time I was here, he, uh, up in front of the group, he really, uh, he got me with a good question, so um, I remember well. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the issue will be really balancing those medications because it looks as if at this point, although the medication dosing might be necessary for his off features, uh, that he's having some dyskinesia. And so there are a couple things that can be done. Sometimes it's lowering the dose of any one medication and perhaps spreading them out differently or adding something. I, I try not to give specific advice because of, you know, just this format. Um, but it sounds as if uh, it's a dyskinetic issue. Uh, and I think that if you were able to work with the doctor that you're seeing right now, um, sometimes showing them uh, that challenge at particular times, such as recognizing that the movements maybe always happen for an hour or two after the dose of medication, and kind of giving them a small diary might help them make an adjustment. But really, that's the type of question that, unfortunately, is best in the office, but it's awfully challenging by uh, telehealth. No, it doesn't take the place, but it, it but it facilitates. It actually helps uh, promote your own dopamine and also helps your own uh, levodopa last longer. And again, that might be one of those strategies as well. Unfortunately, um, that type of sensitivity really takes quite a bit of tweaking and, and kind of hands-on. So... Uh, unfortunately, that would be really the type of thing that has to be answered in the office. But I would say that the hand movements you're referring to are because of, of what appears to be some dyskinesia or excess movements uh, because the medication's awfully potent at that particular time. Uh, the challenge is, is that sometimes that potency is necessary to help treat other symptoms like stiffness or slowness or, or walking. And so it really has to be balanced, unfortunately. But I do think letting his treating physician know they can try to make some uh, educated changes to see if they can lessen uh, some of that sensitivity. Yeah. Okay, thank you, and we miss you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, moving on to uh, Sandpoint, Idaho. Any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, Seattle, Virginia Mason. Okay, thank you. Uh, our last couple, uh, Tenasket, North Valley Hospital. No questions. Thank you very much. And last but certainly not least, uh, Walla Walla, Washington. Any questions from Providence? Okay, uh, and again, if anybody uh, has an additional question, uh, we'll try to capture you at the end. And now we'll turn to our, our folks here in Spokane. Any questions from the audience here for Dr. Santiago? Janet. Sure, you know, being that it's academic, um, I'll be, you know, Besides having clinical duties, I'll have academic duties, and part of that are with my fellows, and so I'll actually be running the preoperative DBS clinic, meaning those patients that may be good candidates, going to the OR, and then doing the programming postoperatively. But for all the patients that I see uh, in that setting, I'll always probably have at least one fellow with me. Now, a fellow, as you know, is a is a physician who's already finished medical school, they've already finished residency, and they're spending a couple years just specializing in Parkinson's, so they're very far in their training, um, and they've chosen to take extra time to specialize. So I'll always have fellows with me, but I personally will be involved in that. So I'll be running the, the DBS component with the fellows in the program. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a suggestion and a question. First of all, the 
suggestion is that you see our doctor by teleconferencing. <laughs> Well, that's very helpful. You know, it's not only an expense issue, right, but should we? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, there, there. Man, they've got these huge cards, and I'm not looking at all. You know? <laughs> they want me to repeat the question. The question is, if a person is at this point uh, the child of a patient who has a known genetic uh, mutation that is consistent with the diagnosis, and they're concerned that a child may have early features, what would the cost be to having that testing done out of pocket? The first question is, should we even be testing? Now, that, that ethical dilemma does matter. And so what I typically do is to see someone like that in formal consultation first, to look at that situation and to prepare the person for both issues, meaning you do or don't have that mutation and you do or don't have particular symptoms. So it's a rather involved process. A number of times gene testing can be done as part of some research protocols. So when a person isn't uh, insured or insurance won't carry genetic testing, which is just as likely sometimes, you may look for an ongoing research trial to have them enrolled so that that can be done so there's no out-of-cost or out-of-pocket cost. Uh, or there are some commercial labs. Genetic testing is expensive at this point. Um, and, you know, there's a host of different costs affiliated with different disease states and different genes. Um, Out-of-pocket in general uh, usually runs a minimum of 750 upwards as much as three to 4,000 based on what it is you're testing for. So that's very cost prohibitive. Um, the first thing, of course, long before worrying about genetic testing is a clinical exam. And to see someone and, you know, physicians often, no matter where they're practicing, have the ability to adjust for people who aren't insured. And if they don't, they should. <laughs> but I think that's the first place to start. Absolutely. Uh, Walter. Is there any work being done to identify a suitable animal model or tissue culture system for evaluating the effectiveness of uh, Parkinson medication? There are a number of animal models. The hard part historically has been that a number of known models that may destroy some of the dopamine cells, like a 6-hydroxy dopamine rat model, doesn't really cause the rat to develop the full spectrum of pathological changes as the human experience. But there are some animal models now, primate, that are much more sophisticated. Um, the rotenone model comes to mind. It's actually got some very significant similarities. And so um, I would say that those types of models are out there. I still don't think, though, that it's easy to translate what happens in an animal model to what happens in the human experience, again, because we really don't do the same things. We don't do the same types of studies, right? We're typically exposing an animal to a very significant experience, maybe a, a certain treatment drug or the absence or a certain type of destructive lesion or a toxin. And ultimately, we're reviewing that on post-mortem. We're looking at that tissue culture. We're looking at that under HPLC or some form of anatomic observation. We don't do that, obviously, with those kinds of numbers with humans. We're looking at what happened to them clinically, and the numbers that actually come to tissue experience are rather small. Um, and so it's a challenge to translate that sometimes. But I would say that there are some fairly strong animal models of late relative to even 10 years ago. That's a very good question. I think there are a number of people that now recognize that, oh, 
<laughs> Jackie, I'm going to blow it every time. What is the role of Aricept at this time in Parkinson's disease? And the idea being that Parkinson's disease patients are vulnerable to some cognitive issues. Not necessarily purely memory, but sometimes multitasking, attentive tasks, sometimes language, word finding. There have been a number of studies that have shown that that drug class, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, whether it's Aricept or Exelon, whether it's pillar by patch, uh, have shown very favorable in individuals that have cognitive challenges in Parkinson's. Again, they can have considerable GI side effects, and that's really the major issue one. And so that coupled with other GI concerns sometimes in Parkinson's has to be watched, and certainly anything cardiac occasionally. Um, but the evidence is, is strong that it helps with Parkinson's disease-related cognitive changes. It's an excellent question. Mary. Sure. It's like, it's like women with hormone replacement, right? The facts change like every year or two. Should you, shouldn't you? Or, uh, yeah. Sure. The question being, you know, Sometimes when you switch care providers, voluntarily or otherwise, um, <laughs> that there's changes in treatment strategies, in particular to Azelect, which is not a very potent drug in terms of how much symptoms it relieves. In early disease, it's rather potent because the physical symptoms aren't that manifest. But in later disease, it really becomes part of a number of other medications that have to be balanced. The question is, should he or should he not be placed back on it? And I would say that's really a question for you with his current provider because it's not really isolated. It's in balance with other medications or maybe a potential research trial that they're considering for Ernie. Mm -hmm. And so you're not sure maybe some of their thinking uh, on why. I think that's the most important thing is to ask why. Now, if the why is simply, I don't see the evidence, um, you can follow up with that and say, I've heard conflicting evidence. If it's because I think clinically there are other things I'd like to do and this is why, then maybe at least you'd understand the decision. But I think if you have that kind of question, it's good to just ask it outright. Write it down first before you walk in because in the rapidity sometimes of a visit, some of those details get lost. Okay. I think our problem is we've been jumping around to providers since you left. So right. the other question is, does uh, the Exelon patch in the higher dose cause sleepiness? Yes. After a month or? Many, many of those medications can cause changes in arousal and wakefulness. Okay. Yes. Do you go back to the smaller dose? You know, usually I have a tendency to uh, be concerned with any sensitivities. I'm kind of very aggressive about that, so I make very small dose changes rather than titrate somebody up rather rapidly. In fact, I'll kind of painstakingly increase medication watching for that so that I approach the right dose rather than overshoot it and have to come back typically. Okay. Sometimes that will occur even at a low dose for some people. They're okay. sensitive to particular drug classes, but I think in order to be certain that that's the cause, because sometimes it can also be fatigue, right? Somebody's under-treated because other drugs were taken away rather than it's a new medication. Mm -hmm. Not knowing the whole story, I always recommend making the single change, right? Make one change and observe. And so if the thought was perhaps this began after increasing the Exelon patch dose most recently, perhaps pulling back to the previous dose when that wasn't present and seeing if that over a few days to a week attenuates. Okay. 
And then, you know, but again, rather systematically, but, you know, as I always say, not only do you want to document that well for yourself, but you want to communicate that to the provider and say, this is our concern. We're considering this. They may agree or not agree, but if they do agree, you document when you did it. So then you'll know when you did it and you can observe the change. Okay. Thank you. That's a good question. Elise? amounts of iron in water and then also you mentioned something about hydrogen peroxide building sure. up in the cells those sure. are my two oh, those questions are great. so heavy metals in general the question is things that have been toxic to the nervous system you know like mad as a hatter from alice in wonderland right mercury poisoning can certainly do things and manganese has been known for years to have parkinson-like and destructive features um, carbon monoxide can cause a number of movement challenges, and, and that area of the brain is vulnerable, a particular thing called hemibolismus or bolismus. Um, typically, those are extremely rare nowadays, right, because there's so many environmental protections in place where they weren't obviously in that industrial age of the 1800s, where a lot of toxic metal exposures were. Iron in water is not an issue. Even though iron metabolism is an issue in dopamine, uh, iron in water has not been seen to be an issue. Uh, and the last thing was about hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is made in extremely minute amounts in a cell that isn't making energy efficiently. Usually we make carbon dioxide in water, which is why we void and why we breathe in and out. All of the energy producing cells in your body ultimately take sugar and make carbon dioxide in water when the system's running smooth. When it's not running smooth and there's stress to the system, one of the products made at the cellular level is hydrogen peroxide. And in accumulation over time, that can be injurious to the cell. And so it's not so much exposure in your environment, but it had to do with a particular chemical pathway in the, in the cell. Those are good questions if I wasn't clear. Sir, in the back. I can hear you. Um, I had a uh, party about uh, 12 years. And uh, during that time, I've had uh, some problem with the urologist. You're my problem. So I go to the urologist, he says, well, it's not my problem. You go, you go to the Parkinson doctor, and he'll help you. I go talk to the, neuro the, neuro the neuro neurologist. He says, goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, so you're honest, and you have any problems. Have you ever heard of doctors not wanting to make money? See, that's the confusing part. You would think that they would all want to take ownership and somehow, you know, make some money off this problem. Party, party says, you know, take your choice. But that hasn't happened. You know, it is. And the bladder is one of the most complex organs in the body in terms of its innervation. And, and, and we all know this by personal experience, right? And I've said this joke in the office. You can be in your car and go five exits and be able to hold your bladder. But the moment you pull into your own garage and you open the door, you can't hold it back that 10 feet. And it's, it's a, that's a truism. And I'm down in 16, 16 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, I, sorry, pal. <laughs> that's right. And no so, the part, so the bladder is affected in Parkinson's disease, and not really the bladder itself, but the nerves to the bladder and that nerve-based activity. And so... The question always is, how does one manage it? I send people to a urologist, especially men, with Parkinson's because I really want to eliminate two other problems, that there's some contributory factor from the prostate which can give similar symptoms, or that there is some intrinsic problem to the bladder. There's an obstruction, some other urological disease. Once they've ruled out the urological problem, then I typically feel pretty comfortable trying a class of medications to see if I can lessen the hyperactivity of the bladder because some of the older ones that are out there not only work in the bladder but in the brain. And they're called anticholinergics. They make your eyes dry. They make your mouth dry. They dry out the bladder, so to speak. But they can also cause confusion and memory challenges. And so some of the newer medications to help with the bladder only work in the bladder and don't work in the brain. The problem is it's a newer drug, which means, of course, it's usually not 
generic and it's usually more expensive. But I would solve that problem essentially by saying if the urologist did see you and they did the workup, they did your voiding studies, they did a cystoscopy to look, they said this is a natural Parkinson's component to your bladder, it's not something else, then I would expect your neurologist or primary care to help with that if the urologist is uh, folding his arms or her arms. Um, but there are some medications that can be helpful for the overactive bladder that are safe to use in Parkinson's. And so I always recommend going to the primary. You know, primaries are often overlooked, but when you have two specialists that have kind of put you in the middle, the referee is always your primary care. It's called bladder monster. It is called bladder monster. Oh, is that, is that your phrase for it? I like that. I'm going to steal it. <laughs> Joyce. If you want to donate our brains to science, um, could you wear a brace or something? You know, there are a number of organizations that do. And um, when I was in New York, there was a particular one. And now in Arizona, there's another one. There's a brain bank, literally part of the Mayo Clinic and the banner system that works with us at Muhammad Ali. Um, and so if that's ever an interest, it only takes a phone call, and they'll tell you the details. Okay. Absolutely. Is it, is it beneficial to science to do that? Yes. Unequivocal. Yes. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I, I think so. I think it's a wonderful gesture. I do. Other questions? Hi, I have a question. I can handle it. Okay. Okay. Okay, Kennewick. You're welcome. And I have to mention that my son Kyle um, thinks that you can walk on water. <laughs> well, now that I've cut my hair, I can't. Uh, it kind of went with the hair. Uh, anyway. <laughs> I sink like a stone now. <laughs> Good luck in the future, and you will be missed more than you know. Well, I appreciate that. But I hear, but I hear Kyle's got a good doc now. He, my good friend John Roberts. See, that's the problem. You know so many people. Well, thank you. You bet. This is Clarkson, yes. Washington, and we have Clarkson, Washington, and we have a question. Sure. Can you can you hold just one second? I was just starting one in Spokane, and I'll come right back to you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> I turn. You know, the question is, how does one respond to an invitation to a clinical trial? It's, it's a rather frightful thing when you think about it, and it's not supposed to be. You know, uh, I have a tendency not to recruit patients to trials uh, outside my practice, right? I, I like to know my patients in great detail and decide if that trial is appropriate for them personally. Not only do they meet the criteria, but are they a person who would benefit from it potentially? Is it something that they're capable of doing? Um, and so it is, it's a somewhat involved. Now there are trials out there, there are trial centers, trial groups that will you know, do mailings or other types of communications to say, we recognize from your prescribing pattern at the pharmacy uh, 
that you may have Parkinson's disease and we have a trial, give us a 1-800 number call. Um, you know, certainly you can call and learn about them. Uh, I honestly believe that unless you're going to a significant academic center where you don't get your everyday care, that is a place that is doing national studies, that really the only way to do a, a clinical trial is in your own physician's practice if there's someone that's offering it because they know you personally. And although there's always requirements in a trial that there's a blinding or a placebo component or, you know, where you're not getting the treatment, um, I think just going to mailings would be awfully uh, daunting. Not to, not to say it might not have been a reputable trial, but it's, it certainly causes some angst when you're not talking to someone that you know that knows you. You're welcome. And I think we're going back to Clarkston. Thank you. Um, Ashley, there's two questions. Regarding deep brain stimulation, is there an upper age limit for this procedure? Case in point, being 80 years old. You know, the original trials were done on patients up to 80 years old. And there have been recent studies that have looked at the quartiles of those that are youngest versus those that are older, including up to 85. It's very individual, and I mean this with all due respect. There are old 50-year-olds and there are young 80-year-olds, and that's just the truth, and that's the same in Parkinson's disease. And so there is not a specific age limit, but there are other determinations, and the most important one being cognitive. And the older we live, the more likely we are to have some cognitive challenges. And so that's why sometimes age appears to be a reason why people don't go to DBS, but it's usually because of some other reason, not age itself. That's an excellent question. Thank you. The second question we have is, is there any link to, uh, between welding and Parkinson's, having the welding as a, as a uh, career? Yes. And in fact, um, it doesn't appear to be that the aerosolized metals that are present in welding necessarily induce a form of Parkinson's separate from what we consider typical Parkinson's disease, but it does appear to hasten its onset by as much as a decade. The idea being that individuals typically present sometime in their 50s, usually by the age of 58, there are Parkinson-like physical features uh, in a number of patients if one is examined. However, in welders, it's thought to uh, certainly be uh, in the 40s for someone uh, who has been welding for years. Now, I say that as a caveat that, that those are studies with people who have been welding certainly a generation before the current generation when OSHA regulations were considerably less. But yes, there is something intrinsic to welding in some of those aerosolized metals that can be Parkinson-inducing. Okay, now we have, people keep coming up here with another question. Uh, is there any connection between Agent Orange and Parkinson's? I think that the recent VA uh, statement that they are uh, opening that into much further understanding and investigation and accepting that would tell you that they by nature are, have a tendency to be conservative. And I think that uh, those types of investigations through the VA uh, I think are going to continue, but I think there are a number of uh, neurological presentations consistent with Agent Orange, Parkinsonism being one of those listed. Okay, thank you. Back to Spokane or any other site? Judith. Hey, this is Miles City, Montana. Okay, Miles City, Montana. Okay. All right, how about, the, how about DBS? Will that help her walking in her gait or posture? That's an excellent question. Well, it really depends on whether or not those things respond to levodopa. The fact is, is that DBS in and of itself is not going to improve something beyond your best dose of medication, at least traditionally when thinking about the subthalamic nucleus or the globus pallidus, the two sites we use. DBS is superior to medication when it comes to tremor abatement. That is the one feature that it does a better job of uh, than probably your best dose of medication. But things such as walking, balance, and gait typically don't improve any more than your best dose. Now, the caveat there is, 
If your best dose of needed medication also causes significant dyskinesia or orthostatic lightheadedness and drops in blood pressure that cause falls, well then certainly DBS uh, and having less medication on board may help offset those other challenges. But strictly from a motor gait perspective, we'd never promote DBS as promoting anything better than the best dose of medication response. Was that clear? Yes, and thank you very much. You're very welcome. Appreciate your help. We have a question, Russell. Okay. Judith, you're going to go to the end. Please. Okay. If you take um, the dosages and the carbidopa, levodopa too close together throughout the day, can that cause like some confusion and maybe some thickness in talking? Yes. No question. Usually people have a tendency to try to treat a particular symptom, such as they're starting to feel off, they're feeling fatigued, nervous, depressed, uh, tremor, stiffness, slowness. And so wearing off, they'll have a tendency to take their next dose sooner, and then that has the other challenges of drowsiness, lightheadedness, confusion, sometimes voice changes, uh, dyskinesia or unwanted movements and so again it has to do with the fact that the dosing it's awfully challenging sometimes to know how much potency someone needs as well as how much duration they need so those those don't overlap uh, and that's why I'm actually a big fan of of hour by hour uh, uh, tracking of that with my patients but uh, yes taking them too close together you can have those types of medication effects Selegiline. Selegiline is the generic version. Oh, okay, because that's something that um, my father's on right at this moment. Okay. And so that is for just to help with the um, functions of the Parkinson's or to... Sure, it can, it, it can extend the length of the levodopa, although it does affect the potency a little bit, and sometimes that does allow for less frequent dosing so that the doses don't overlap. But again, it, it, you know, it, it can be adjusted by dietary changes, how well they rested, how accurate they are with their, uh, with their medications. And so, you know, again, sometimes really watching that diary for two or three days can really give a lot of information. Okay. You're, very, you're very welcome. Uh, last couple questions. Uh, we've got one here in Spokane uh, to kind of wrap things up here. I appreciate everybody. Uh, bringing these forward. Uh, so, Judy Sloan, you have a question here in Spokane? Yes. Do you have an update on a new pro patch coming back? The, uh, the word on the street is, is that they still had some challenges with the FDA because of how were they going to protect the patch in terms of keeping it temperature regulated, right? However, at the same time, while the restriction was going on, the trials were ongoing at higher doses. So I always look around to see what they're doing from a business perspective because they don't always reveal what they're up to. And uh, they, the American Academy of Neurology recently met in the spring, and um, UCB did a big rollout and had big tables and had all these things discussing the value of new pro making me assume that they are trying to keep people aware of who they are, probably assuming that they're coming back on market. There have been some competitions lately with like Requip XL, right, which isn't really the same. And so um, if you just see the way the company's posturing, separate from any other facts or data, they seem to be posturing as if they're going to be able to launch. Thank you. You're welcome. And I didn't say anything propriety, so. <laughs> okay, uh, one last question. Okay, Spokane. Can you speak to anything or any of um, Is there a going to be an empirical test for Parkinson's disease? That's a great question. So the question is, is there some way that we could create a blood test, a spinal fluid test, an MRI that would be Uniform, sensitive, specific, affordable, 
standardized. Yes, I, I firmly believe that. Do I think we're there? No. Do I think that there are some candidates? Basically, these are neural imaging markers looking at specific ligands or binders that will look at it at a chemical or functional level. I think there are subgroups of patients that we can see that. There are some things we use. We use some dopamine transporter imaging by something called beta-CIT, which is a cocaine analog, and that was developed by Ken Merrick at Yale in New Haven. Um, there are developments along those lines. I honestly believe that is where we're headed, and the idea is to couple that perhaps with the earliest recognition, perhaps it is a family with a known genetic marker. Now take their children, their siblings that are asymptomatic and image to see if there's some coherence. Um, sporadically screening, I think, is a ways down the road. Um, but that is absolutely the holy grail. Everything that we talked about here today, and, and George, you're always kind of on the cutting edge of anything that you bring up, that's everything that we're working on. Because the idea being is if there's anything that's disease modifying, the idea is as early as possible to recognize that disease state and to treat aggressively early if something is disease modifying. I think it's going to be an imaging marker. And I think there'll be a subgroup of patients that they'll identify perhaps by a known genetic marker coupled to that. And then it may extend into the general public. Uh, but that, that's what it's all about. That's an excellent question. So you're saying then that it's, it's beneficial to know when you have symptoms that you have Parkinson's because it can be treated and it may be... Not so much treated. We wouldn't treat, but it does help us identify as early as possible the potential for that to develop in particular vulnerable individuals so we can track that. And again, remember, we care for the individual, but we also care for the group. We're trying to cure the group. And so sometimes in a particular individual, it may not make a difference in their personal life course. But gathering that information is so important, hence the, the two hats you wear between care and cure. Will you come back again to speak in six months? I can't say six months, but I'll certainly come back. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dr. Santiago. Excellent uh, discussion, and thank you, everybody, for your terrific questions. Uh, just a couple quick announcements before we end here. Uh, the DVD for today's session, as always, is available. It'll be available next week. Uh, you can uh, get a copy of it by either going on our website or contacting the Parkinson's Resource Center here in Spokane or give them a call. Uh, so uh, if you're interested, uh, please do contact us. Our next uh, telehealth is Monday, July 12th, uh, here uh, out of St. Luke's here in Spokane, and the presenter will be Kristen Rue. Uh, she's going to bring uh, a couple other uh, folks with her, and uh, they're going to be talking about uh, their experience and their key learnings uh, with the time that they spend at the National Parkinson's Foundation. So that should be a very interesting uh, and enlightening uh, discussion. Um, with that, I, I think today's talk is, is a great example of, of why we have telehealth and the value that it brings to uh, everybody out, uh, not only here in the Spokane area, but all of our remote sites and other communities. And I thank all of you in the remote sites and certainly our host, St. Luke's, again, and all our sponsors for making this happen because the key, and I think Dr. Santiago would agree, the key to success of overcoming and, and uh, addressing any of these uh, illnesses is knowledge, and knowledge is power. And so you guys uh, being here is a great first step uh, along a continued walk of better understanding this disease and addressing it. So again, I thank everybody for your time today, and I'd be remiss if I didn't <laughs> make one last uh, comment here. Uh, remember, anyone who speaks for us is certainly a friend of ours, uh, like Dr. Santiago today and you get a free parkie, so don't forget that, all right? Anyway, thanks again. Uh, God bless everybody, and have a great day.